Okay, well, thanks everyone for bearing with the technology. Okay, well, happy Speech Pathology Awareness Week and thanks for asking me to talk about my passion, which is telepractice. Um, I'm really hoping that we'll be able to persuade more speech pathologists to use telepractice as part of their usual business. Um, I just want to tell you a bit about myself because I don't come from Sydney and I've um, grown up in Melbourne and I've spent most of my career working as the sole speech pathologist in Hamilton in Western Victoria. So I worked at Western District Health Service, which was an early adopter of telehealth and provided a lot of support for any telehealth initiatives. I started offering telepractice in Hamilton to save clients the time, expense and inconvenience of travelling to therapy. I remember huddling around my computer with a lady with motor neurone disease, her husband, the GP and the dietitian. At the other end, huddled around another computer with a speech pathologist, the neurologist and the dietitian from Calvary Healthcare. We didn't have a raft of policies and procedures to guide us. And in fact, don't tell anyone, but we used Skype. <laughs> we just used our common sense and made sure the client was in agreement with what we were doing. She was very grateful that she saved a trip to Melbourne. Okay, so in 2013, I started providing online therapy privately. And now my colleague Simone Dudley and I have a private online paediatric speech and occupational therapist, therapy practice. We are registered with the Helping Children with Autism Program and Better Start Early Intervention Panel. As well as being registered to provide early childhood and therapeutic support in all states and territories with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. If you've registered for the NDIS in one state or territory, you will understand that meeting the requirements of every state and territory was no mean feat. Simone and I both live on farms that have always had to travel long distances to work. Simone lives in the Riverina in New South Wales and I live in Western Victoria, not far from the South Australian border. I have great mobile uh, broadband signal, so I can work from home, but at this stage, Simone travels 30 kilometres to Tadeliquin to get adequate internet speed for video conferencing. I'm sure there are some clients in everyone's caseload who would find telepractice to be more suitable than attending in person. I'm hoping today that if you haven't tried using telepractice yet, that you will think of a client that you could start with. Most of our clients use telepractice because they live in rural and remote areas and they can't access regular therapy when it's needed. In many cases, there are long waiting lists for existing services and the services are fashioned, like a six week block of therapy once or twice a year or an outreach service might be provided every six to 12 weeks. Certainly not enough therapy to meet best practice for children with disability. Many of the children we work with have early intervention funding, and although they've been found to be eligible for funding, they've had little if any options for purchasing therapy. There are no private practices available, or they have to travel long distances for private services. Rural children with a disability are much less likely to register for funding, and they access a lot less of their funds and their metropolitan counterparts. There are lots of other people who can benefit from telepractice. Consider a man who was a shearer and became a phabic after a stroke. Although he wasn't physically impaired, his doctor told him not to drive for several months. He attended therapy twice a week, but his partner had to take time off work to drive him 65 kilometres each way to therapy. He came once in person with his partner, and then he tried video conferencing from the hospital in his town. After that, he chose to video conference for every session because he could walk to the local hospital independently and his partner could go to work. Think about a girl I worked with who had a bilateral cochlear, had bilateral cochlear implants. 
Her mum was advised that they should attend a program of 12 weekly visits to speech therapy at the hospital start to finish. The mum drove to Melbourne with her daughter and her baby son each week. Wouldn't it have been great if we could have observed the sessions remotely, if I could have watched the sessions remotely, or that the family could have come to Hamilton and the therapist from the Cochrane Implant Clinic could coach us from a distance. These situations are magnified for clients who live rurally and have to travel long distances for therapy. So it seems obvious that telepractice might provide part of the solution. However, it might be equally suitable for the lady with motor neurone disease who lives in the suburbs but has to travel to the inner city to meet with the team. Although she might be quite independent at home, she will have to ask a family member to drive her to the city. They'll have to negotiate the traffic, park the car and make their way to the clinic. It's a big effort. So we've got the technology. We're getting the internet coverage. The evidence for telepractice is emerging. Speech Pathology Australia has a position paper supporting the use of telepractice helping children with autism, better start and the National Disability Insurance Scheme fund therapy services delivered by telepractice. So if we want to pro provide fantastic client care, we should all be offering telepractice as part of our range of services. So why don't more speech pathologists use telepractice? Some service providers are so busy trying to deal with the number of clients coming through the doors for therapy that they haven't got the time or the incentive to worry about those people who can't get to the clinic. It's hard to make a case for them to add telepractice to their services unless it will reduce their caseload somehow. Certainly if it saves them having to travel to see clients, it could be worth the effort. I was talking to a speech pathologist in the Northern Territory recently. She has a caseload of more than 200 children who live remotely she travelled a lot. If she was able to provide teletherapy services, she would be able to alternate in-person visits with virtual visits and probably be able to see some families more often than she does now. Some therapists are worried that telepractice client group. I have heard a colleague say, telepractice is a great idea, but it would never work with my autistic clients. I have to get my hands on them. I understood exactly what she meant. When you have an autistic child in the room with you, you bring out your bag of tricks and see which ones you can use to engage the child. Please wind up toys, bubbles, noisemakers, marble runs, and if they don't work, we get more things out of the cupboard. We're very practicing engaging children and we tempt them to communicate with us in some way. The challenge with telepractice is to think what you would do if the child was in the room with you and then try to replicate that at a distance. When we provide, we discuss with the mum about the best toys and books and games to bring that engage her child, and then we coach the mum to encourage more communication while she and the child play together with the toys. This mum knew exactly what to put in the box to bring to the table to engage her son with an autism spectrum disorder. She's got a box next to her and one thing after another. And I just have to tell you that I look a bit funny in this photo because I was actually on the road that day and doing a, a session from my car. Some people think the child will need to be able to sit in front of the computer for 45 minutes, if only they would. We don't expect the young children who come to our clinic to sit at the table for the entire session. And neither do we expect children receiving teletherapy to stay on a chair. We draw on the child's interest to entice them back to the room in the clinic. This nearly three-year-old boy with autism spectrum disorder would stay for a while at an activity for a few minutes, and then he would grumble and leave for a while before his mum would bring him back for the next activity. You can see that we're doing some text there with his picture on the wall. Table. So this parent taking the child by the hand and bringing him back to the table was a new experience in itself. So some therapists are worried that they don't have the skill set for telepractice. They're worried about using the technology, about how to adapt their skills or how to adapt their therapy activities to an online model. 
They're worried about privacy. They're worried about which policies and procedures they need to observe and some platform to use. So my advice is to try to keep it simple. Use the video conferencing program that you and the family are familiar with. And of course, you have to follow any protocols in your workplace. Some schools block social media programs like Skype, policies about which video conferencing platform can be used. We use Zoom and we haven't had any problem communicating with schools or health services. It is HIPAA compliant, meaning that it meets the privacy and security standards that protect the confidentiality of patient health information. A meeting by clicking on a link, they don't need to download the program. So start small, use your tried and tested activities. Email picture cards, board games and activities for the family to print. Later you can add some online subscriptions like resources and here builder. Okay, I found books have gone too far. It's hard to teach parents about book reading together or monitoring for reading comprehension when I couldn't see the book. They were looking at online like the subscription share. We're reading together. Decided to participate in the research. Children and their families. The children had complex disabilities. There's your details. If everyone wants to write down your details, um, if, they, if they'd like to uh, follow up with you, that would be excellent. Um, okay. So the connection broke up just on the last slide, um, okay. unfortunately. All right, thank you very much, Sue. Would everyone give Sue a big round of applause? <laughs> Finish that, Sue. No, that was all. I just have a few other questions. Uh, was there any other questions? Yes. Yes, so what platforms do you use, Sue? Oh, we, we use Zoom. That Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. Yes. Zoom yes. Yeah, so they, Zoom is free, but they use a pro version for the practice. Okay, and if you're a, a local, Andy knows about Zoom. Um, email any other questions. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to hang this up, and um, I'm going to get Rachel to come up and do the next presentation, which is here, and hopefully this time people at a distance will be able to hear the sound as well, because last time they couldn't. Yes, yes, I will.